Uh, Mr. Murphy, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate your uh, testimony uh, here today. I, I want to get back to this question that we've been tossing around about metrics. Um, and as compelling as data is about the number of roads paved and the number of children educated, um, it, it strikes me that that's ultimately not why we're there. If, if just investments in social uh, infrastructure and in hard infrastructure were our end product here, then we should be in a lot of places in the world. The, the, the metric here ultimately is, uh, to Mr. Quigley's point, is whether or not we are creating the conditions upon which people will feel better about the United States and feel less um, inclined to uh, move into an extremist movement there that threatens both the stability of the country and threatens the United States. Uh, and so I guess my question is, how, how do, do, do you think about how we measure that? And what are the ways in which we can do it? I think I agree. It's hard to do that on a national basis um, because we've got a lot of other competing factors that are hard to measure for. But I wonder if there are ways to do that on a localized basis in areas of the country that we have heavy investments in and where we are paving roads and putting kids to school and setting up health clinics. Is there a way to measure what the, um, uh, what the sentiment there is to the United States and what the local activity of extremist groups are in those uh, in those areas. I'd be interested to hear a little bit about how we measure what is our ultimate objective uh, rather than our intermediary objective of making the investments and making them stick. Uh, on, the, on the more macro picture, the, the combating extremism is, is obviously a, a core reason, if not the core reason, for um, uh, for part of our assistance programs as laid out again in our in our regional stabilization strategy um, and in fact the 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 kind of central uh, focus of the president's speech on Afghanistan and Pakistan on on December 1st um, so clearly how successful we are in ultimately combating uh, extremism is um, is 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 critical to this um, the metrics in terms of actually gauging and evaluating that are, are obviously a lot more difficult. I mean, it is something that's part of every conversation. There are uh, more specific aspects um, that we uh, attempt to use in combating extremism. The the new um, public diplomacy and, and uh, counter-propaganda programs that we've had and trying to get out uh, more moderate voices more frequently. Um, but in terms of actually uh, how we gauge uh, the moderating impact um, or uh, even you know whether we'll have access to that information and, and certainly not yet I think at this point it's a far longer term process is one that you know we're continuing to, to evaluate how we how we best capture that information in the in the relative short term the 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 outputs are are, are the easiest gauge um, but clearly they don't tell the whole story as well and we have to say not only how many schools are built but how they're then used and what the sustainability is and ultimately what the literacy rate in that region is and so it's it's a constant process of adjusting that as we get the information and over the course of time um, but um, but with the, the the ultimate goal the the combating uh, extremism is is, is, is certainly um, a core piece of that I don't know, uh, more very good questions <laughs> I would just add that uh, um, in the end uh, one of the metrics I kind of keep in my mind is the continuity and the strength of the civilian government and the existence of the civilian-led gov civilian government in Pakistan. It's an indicator to me of uh, their satisfaction with a civilian elected and a civilian-led government because of the, uh, as you know, the, the rotations over time of civilian government versus military government um, and uh, strengthening that relationship between the people as I said earlier, the governed and the governing is extremely important. And I think we'll see indicators of that in the coming months in Pakistan because they are now going through in each province decisions by each provincial assembly as to how they will hold their own local elections, their equivalent of district or Nazim, it used to be called Nazim elections. That I think will be, you asked at the local level, an indicator of what are the people thinking about the way that Pakistan government is moving forward in servicing its people. And it'll be a mixed story. I'm absolutely sure it'll be a mixed, a mixed message 
To me, rule of law is extremely important in how they perceive rule of law at the local level, how they perceive corruption by local officials or not at the local level, and how they perceive delivery of services and their demand for those services at the local level. I, I understand how difficult this is, and I understand even when you're talking about local measurements like election results, it's very difficult to extrapolate that simply to USAID versus a lot of other factors. But to the extent, uh, Mr. Feldman, you were talking about the White House's new effort to try to implement metric strategies, I think to the extent that we can, that we can try to get at our end goal and in some way measure that back to where we have made investments and where we haven't, it makes it a lot more helpful for, for those of us who right now are operating on faith and, and, and who believe this is the right strategy, to go back and translate that to our constituents back home that are sometimes skeptical of us spending this amount of money abroad instead of here at home. So I, I'd encourage you to continue to think about how to uh, best measure that. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Mr. Lynch, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank both of our witnesses for your, your help with the committee's work. Uh, we were Okay. Uh, we were in uh, Pakistan several weeks ago uh, meeting with some of the uh, USAID and, and some of our NGOs there. And there was some concern raised about uh, the, well, the focus is right, I think, in terms of uh, the federally administered uh, tribal areas in the Northwest uh, uh, Province. However, uh, there was some, some concern about the safety of, uh, of NGO, NGO personnel uh, in some of those regions, and there was a uh, sort of a uh, a reassessment going on, I, I guess you could call it, where um, Western employees were sort of hunkering down in areas uh, closer into Islamabad and trying to get services out uh, to the population in those areas through Pakistani nationals, and it was a sort of a uh, they, they were changing it on the fly, and there were there were even uh, you know uh, sustained concerns about the safety of those uh, Pakistani nationals doing work on on our behalf or on behalf of the uh, the Pakistani people, and I, I was just trying to get a sense of uh, how. How much is that affecting the efficacy of our our attempts here to to bring capacity to those uh, those governments in in the tribal areas in the northwest frontier province? Uh, I appreciate your question, Congressman Lynch. Um, it's one on our minds all the time. It's our preeminent concern, frankly, um, uh, and we have. Uh, in, in both in Afghanistan and in Pakistan, we've lost a lot of a lot of our uh, a lot of people paid under our assistance programs. Uh, more, of course, in Afghanistan than in Pakistan. Um, and uh, uh, the local nationals, in this case Pakistanis, are the ones who are most exposed. Uh, we we know. Uh, I mean, the head of CHF was uh, murdered in Peshawar a year ago along with his, uh, one of his uh, Pakistani staff. Uh, there have been kidnappings of uh, staff from our NGOs. So Sir, could I ask you to just speak up a little bit? I'm an old iron sure, worker, sure, sure. and I, I have bad what, hearing. What we've, what we've tried to do now, and since the time you were there, is whenever any of our partners come to us, and it's usually at their initiative, to say, will we uh, provide funding to them so they can adjust their agreements, their contract or their grant or their cooperative agreement, as we call it, to allow some expenses to improve their security. Uh, we look at that very seriously and make sure in consultation with our security office, regional diplomatic security people at the embassy, that we come to a mutually agreeable accommodation so that, in fact, they can try to improve their security. We also count, have to count on uh, the, uh, on the Pakistani uh, uh, security services themselves to assist us with the right kind of information about areas where these people work and where they have to go into 
uh, and come back and commute back and forth. So we, we have done that kind of coordination since the time that you were there and raised some of these concerns and were responsive to them. So it has not stopped us from being able to operate and to be able to support FATA Secretariat and others, for example, or even in the Northwest Frontier. But uh, it is certainly something that constrains us uh, on any given day. Okay. All right. I'm just about out of time. Uh, Ashley, Mr. Fellman, would you like to add to that, please? I, I completely agree with, with what Jim said. I mean, it's a constant calibration between obviously having to be mindful of the security situation and, and wanting to um, protect lives while also trying to do the critical assistance work that, uh, that we continue to do in, in those areas. Um, I would give as a, as a recent example, um, the U.S. Uh, has agreed to provide $55 million for reconstruction projects in South Wazaristan focused on roads, dams, rehabilitation, and power grid. And General Zubair has, has uh, worked very closely with, uh, with Ambassador Rafal and our embassy in Islamabad um, to, to, to um, ensure that access for U.S.-funded Pakistani monitors would be one of their top priorities. And so as we continue to try to push forward, and there's a, a range of other uh, oversight mechanisms we've tried to put in place in that, which I'm happy to talk about uh, later, fixed reimbursement agreements and things like this. But, um, but we have tried to uh, you know, work with and mitigate to the extent we, we can the security situation um, while still, uh, you know, while, while still being very cautious about, uh, uh, about risking lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Van Hollen, you recognize five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both uh, for your uh, service. And I want to commend you and the whole team on what I think has been significant progress uh, over the last uh, year or so uh, in Pakistan. And I think we're beginning to see the results, at least with respect to re responsiveness and engagement of the government of Pakistan. Uh, in fighting the most extreme elements. It wasn't long ago uh, that President Musharraf was entering into non-aggression pacts with the Pakistani Taliban in Swat Valley, uh, largely as a result of the change in government and the engagement uh, of the new administration, a diplomatic, political, economic offensive. Uh, you have a much greater degree of cooperation engagement. Not only has the military gone after the Pakistani Taliban, uh, but they've also taken very important steps in going after elements of the Afghan uh, Taliban uh, based in uh, Pakistan. We saw that, obviously, with the arrest of uh, Mullah Omar's uh, operational head and the arrest of the uh, shadow governors uh, and other signs of greater cooperation. And, and that is a result, I believe, of greater confidence and cooperation between the U.S. government and the Pakistani government and a view on the Pakistani side that they have a big stake as well uh, in defeating extremism, whether it's the Pakistan Taliban or ultimately trying to resolve the situation with the Afghan uh, Taliban. So I think that uh, that is important uh, progress, and I think it's the result, in part, of engagement at all levels, including economic engagement, and sending the signal that we are there uh, for the longer term. Uh, and I uh, commend you on the idea of trying to channel more resources through Pakistani contractors and indigenous institutions, uh, with the caveat, of course, and you've raised this, that we have to make sure there's transparency and accountability. As we, as we put more funds through local organizations and build capacity, we need to make sure that those monies are being well spent. Now, on the other side, so there's building this relationship with the government, but we're all frustrated with the fact that if you take a poll in Pakistan today, among the Pakistani people, the United States is held in very low regard. And as the chairman pointed out, you know, what was a very good thing, the Kerry Luger uh, Berman legislation aid, uh, we, you know, it was like kicking the gift horse in the mouth. Uh, although we don't see it as a gift, we see it as part of our engagement and interest. At the same time, it was something that was a good thing. Uh, so while I like the idea of channeling more funds and building capacity, at the same time, those American taxpayer dollars are not necessarily, we, we don't get the, the, the credit necessarily uh, for those investments in the mind of the Pakistani people. And I think there's a real feeling that while we pumped millions and millions of dollars into important things like institution building and democratic building, that if you were to turn around and ask the average Pakistani citizen, you know, what has the, the United States done in terms of economic development, 
it's, it's hard for them to identify something. So uh, my question is, in addition to doing these kind of things, should we not also think of doing some of the things we used to do in the past, USID used to do much bigger investments that were important investments in the country, uh, but at the same time drew the national attention of the Pakistani people, clearly identified as a something, an investment being made by the United States in the future of Pakistan and the future relationship, because there is a concern that after spending all this money, especially as you channel it more through the government of Pakistan, which builds capacity, that n no one in Pakistan among the Pakistani population can say, well, yeah, the United States helped us in this particular concrete way. If you could respond to that and what, what uh, ideas you have with respect to some of these other projects. Uh, Congressman, I, I, we certainly uh, agree with your comments. Uh, it's important that the Pakistani people have some visibility and see uh, the benefits of cooperation with the American people and the American Assistance Program with uh, our people's money. Um, uh, so we are looking and have already initiated the first wave in the last few months of assistance to the energy sector, uh, trying to rehabilitate and repair some of their existing power systems. They will see that to the extent they see things quickly in the press. They should also see it in terms of the effects in certain parts of the country on their load shedding. Now again, these are the, just the first steps. It's a country of 175 million people, plus or minus. Uh, it's more than half the population of our country. So when you take that, even with a very generous assistance program we have now, it's still less than eight or nine dollars per capita in the country. So we have to do this extremely catalytically, and we have to be very thoughtful on how we approach this. So we'll be working in energy, which all Pakistanis can immediately identify with as a need. We'll be working in water, which is an extremely important feature for the Pakistanis, both in agriculture, in quality of water, potable water in their communities, but also in water distribution systems, and obviously because of Indus Basin Treaty concerns that are also political concerns in the country. Uh, so th those are just some quick examples, but we want to make sure as we do those more infrastructure programs that the policy reforms are there too, so that our people's money uh, is, is put into programs that in fact will uh, be sustainable financially, and uh, uh, that's a, that those are the two examples I'd like to share with you. Thanks, Congressman Van Hollen. I, um, I appreciate your, your stage setting as well because I think it is uh, critical as we think about how we continue to move forward, what the metrics are, recognizing that there's still great, uh, uh, a sense of great skepticism about um, the American relationship among Pakistanis that just a year ago the Taliban were a hundred miles from Islamabad. I mean, we were uh, facing a quite critical scenario in that over the course of the past year, uh, through the increased uh, cooperation at every level of, uh, of government, um, we have seen uh, the development of a, of a far more uh, cooperative, constructive, uh, civilian-based relationship, which I think is starting to yield uh, real benefits now, but it will take I think a significant amount of time to continue to see these benefits as per the earlier questions about how do you actually gauge uh, something like combating extremism. Um, your question on, uh, on, on how, we, how these benefits help to accrue to the U.S., how, how, how people help to, uh, how people focus on uh, what the U.S. has contributed to them in our, in our development projects is obviously one that the development community uh, grapples with all the time. And as we came to it um, in terms of looking at how we could best use this Kerry Luger Berman money, we, um, we also went through the exact same calculus. And we really tried to walk the line between continuing to do the institutional capacity building uh, as we've done over time, but also demonstrate, and this is where this, this whole term of either signature projects or high impact, high visibility projects ha has come from, but to do at least uh, one type of those projects in each of the five or six main sectors we've identified that are most important to Pakistani, starting with energy, given, given the Secretary's trip last fall, and, and, and um, the second one being water, um, showing that we're hearing the concerns 
uh, of the Pakistani people beyond just the border regions, beyond where we're seen to have a, a more narrow targeted interest. And I think um, the, uh, the, the process that evolved as we considered what we could do in the energy field was a very instructive one. I think we, we started with the idea of let's build something big that we can stand on and have a ribbon cutting and everyone will know that, uh, that, that America built this. And as we looked more and more into it, first of all, uh, the costs were exorbitant, the sustainability issues were, were, were there, um, it was questionable what the needs were. And as we started looking more at the actual needs, uh, it became far more uh, clear that working on the efficiency issues, uh, working on getting more watts on the grid, avoiding some of uh, the blackouts in, in uh, high consumer and commercial areas, um, which we could do relatively quickly and easily through this $125 million uh, tube well project, um, would be far more constructive, um, far more efficient, and, and more sustainable. And, um, and so instead of the kind of signature energy project, a dam or something like that, we have come up with this ener signature energy initiative. And I think that the same process is unfolding in many of the other sectors. Uh, in education, uh, you know, we could have uh, looked at building an American university. Um, but again, how sustainable is that over the long term? What are, what are, what's the commitment there? Um, does that become a target in and of itself? And so I think, uh, although we're still very much in the process of trying to determine which direction we're going in, and Post and USA and, and State together are, are actively looking at a number of these projects in the, in the remaining sectors, something like a, a center of excellence at an existing university or some sort of faculty, which would be seen as this is a gift of the American people or in, done in co conjunction, cooperation with the American people, helps to build that, but is also not necessarily the grand uh, bricks and mortar uh, vision that we had of, of big development projects in the in the 60s and 70s. Thank you, Mr. Feldman. Uh, Mr. Welch, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, I thank you very much. You know, the dilemma I think all of us uh, have is number one, uh, what's the basic purpose of the aid? Uh, and uh, it has to be tied, obviously, to national security. However, uh, else we describe it. Uh, and number two. Uh, in order to deliver that aid, how can it be effective? How can we get our money's worth? And the models that we've used, uh, whether it was depending on international contractors and NGOs where there's a high overhead, uh, whether it's dependent on Pakistani min ministries where there's a high level of corruption, uh, and whether it's dependent on NGOs where uh, there's huge oversight problems, the only way we can be successful uh, and I'll, I'll just ask you this, is whether we have, Mr. Be Beaver, uh, a, an honest and uh, a competent uh, Pakistani partner. I mean, would you agree with that? Absolutely. So if we don't, I mean, there's disputes between the military and uh, uh, the civilian government. Uh, there's a weak civilian government that's up and down. Uh, other than for purposes of domestic consumption and the need that uh, uh, we have to at least appear that we're attempting uh, to win hearts and minds through development projects, through economic opportunity projects, through education projects. If we are honest with ourselves and ask the hard question, can we realistically be successful when the implementation ex and execution really requires an honest partner in Pakistan? Well, uh, this is one of the purposes of our financial pre-award assessments. Uh, it's our procurement officers, it's our controllers, it's our project officers also that check out these organizations before we well, see, provide this is my assistance point. to I mean, them. I, 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 or, it's a real dilemma. I don't mean to be challenging because yeah, I know you're yeah, doing your level yeah. best. And it, obviously it's desirable for us to be doing uh, projects that are going to improve the, li the lives of uh, Pakistani people. But there is a hard question that we have to ask. We can have all the auditors in the world. We can have all of the honest NGOs in the world. Uh, but if there's not a mechanism that is, uh, uh, that is solid, uh, in Pakistan, uh, we're going to have uh, Iraq all over again. I mean, that's a, that's the hard question, and and what you seem to be acknowledging is that we really do need an honest partner there. 
Uh, Mr. Feldman, how about you? Of course, I, I absolutely agree that we need an honest partner. We're doing everything that we can to to work with the honest partners to identify those, to vet them, and to and, no, to, and, and to make sure. And to, politeness requires that we say kind things, but the mechanisms over there uh, don't exist. It, it's it's our need now because we have an urgent national security need. Uh, things have changed, uh, apparently somewhat for the better, as Mr. Van Hollen has mentioned. But I think most of us would probably come to the conclusion that it had much more to do uh, with a self-interested conclusion made by the Pakistani military uh, that the uh, the Afghan Taliban or the pardon me the Pakistani Taliban were starting to cause trouble that made their lives difficult. It was not a result of uh, the 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 the, the Kerry Luger aid. I mean, would you agree with that? Uh, I think it's a combination of factors. I, I think that it's an evolving, changing relationship that's dependent on many things, and I think that the Kerry Lee uh, Berman aid will be quite critical for that. Well, I see, think when, when I was there, I mean, I just I was there uh, uh, with the chairman, and what was really apparent when you're there is how incredibly difficult it is to actually get a water project, an education project, you name it, how hard it is to actually do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can talk here, and we can talk about metrics, but. It, it, there's an abstract quality to it because the people on the ground, the security challenges they face, the lack of infrastructure, uh, administrative infrastructure to make it happen, these are enormous impediments to the best intention, the best and hardest working people. Uh, and, you know, for domestic reasons here, we have to act beyond military. Uh, but on the other hand, with all of the practical problems, I wonder whether it doesn't make sense to do a big visible project uh, somewhat like the, 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 the approach described by Mr. Van Hollen. It's easier to control uh, the, the, the money, uh, more confidence that you'll get uh, a dollar's worth of, uh, well, maybe 70 cents worth of uh, work for a dollar's worth of income. Uh, and it is a substantial and visible project. Uh, I mean, maybe I just, I know my time's up, ask each of you to briefly comment on that. Uh, I, I would just comment that in my experience uh, with Pakistan over a quarter of a century and half my career, there are leaders in Pakistan, there are reformers in Pakistan, right. there are many right. Pakistanis of very high integrity, such high integrity that sometimes in past governments they could not be trusted and they were sidelined and some of them are back uh, and there are there is a growing I think appreciation by the Pakistani business community and Pakistani civil society that they have to take more charge uh, uh, at their levels for the future of their country and to hold their leaders uh, as accountable as we hold our leaders accountable and I think that's a very important phenomenon that's evolving in Pakistan today and obviously the extremist threats to the country's future helped to mobilize that whether it was attacks on universities or police stations in Lahore uh, regardless of those things that were going on in the FATA and the NWFP and I think the real future of that country and our assistance to it is linked to our ability to support those who have the courage inside their own society to transform their own society and that's where we will be most effective and over the long run getting to Congressman Van Hollen's question also, that's where the Pakistani people will thank the American people the most, but it'll take time. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Mr. Drehos, you recognize the five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for, for being here today. Um, I just wanted to follow up on, on Mr. Van Hollen's comments about Pakistani perception of USAID in Pakistan. I'm a former Peace Corps volunteer, uh, and I'm curious as to how we are engaging in soft diplomacy. Uh, there are many projects, uh, massive projects, uh, littered around developing countries uh, that were done counter uh, to the will uh, of the people in certain countries that uh, because of one reason or another uh, were, were failures and they stand out as failures of USAID policy um, in those countries. Yet we know that a soft diplomacy often works very effectively in, in terms of changing opinion uh, toward the United States um, of, you know, folks that are, you know, obviously uh, living in those countries. So I was wondering just if you could start off by telling me what we're doing to engage in soft diplomacy in Pakistan. I guess uh, 
uh, Congressman, first of all, I would say uh, it, it, it'll depend in part how we define soft diplomacy. But uh, in terms of if it also includes um, democracy and governance-related activities, uh, whether it's um, just person-to-person uh, -person, uh, contacts, which is going to be uh, part of the, one of the key areas for the uh, strategic dialogue uh, next week and continuing to build those um, ties with, uh, with NGOs, obviously continuing to build ties uh, with both uh, uh, federal um, and uh, and provincial leaders, uh, parliamentarians, and uh, and other elected leaders. The democracy and governance program, and, and Jim can uh, give more details, has um, a parliamentary strengthening um, uh, dimension to it, a local governance dimension to it, um, an elections-based dimension to it. I know that uh, NDI and IRI and, and other organizations are very interested in continuing to do more. There's a whole range of, on, on the softer diplomacy, there's a whole range of kind of communications mechanisms. Our new Under Secretary of Public Diplomacy, Judith McHale, has uh, put together a, a very robust uh, communications uh, uh, strategy, which has already started putting out bids for uh, children's educational TV programs uh, uh, in, in local languages, um, uh, uh, other communications uh, uh, programming, radio, television, using uh, new social media networks, cell phones, and, and other things. So there's there are a, a range of activities uh, that are that are currently in the works and, and starting to be implemented. Um, but um, but I'm happy to to come back and. Well, and I, I guess I'm I'm concerned that those all seem to be up here. And and what are we doing at the ground level in in the villages, you know, in the cities, in terms of touching people, you know, face to face, in terms of uh, American uh, Americans uh, on the ground. Um, and, and engaging in some type of cultural exchange in addition to development. And because, you know, the, when we talk about democratization, when we talk about, you know, federal government intervention with the Pakistani government, uh, that's a bit different than being at the village level uh, and on the ground. Yeah, I, if I could just add, Congressman, uh, one, of the, one of the evolutions you will see this year in our program, security permitting, will be deepening our, our, our depth, uh, deepening our presence in the country. We will be moving out of just Islamabad, I'm talking about AID, and establishing regional offices in Lahore to service the people of Punjab, in, in uh, Karachi to service the people of the Sindh and uh, Baluchistan, uh, in addition to a very modest presence in Peshawar, which is constrained right now for American officers by security. Um, and that will enable American officers again, I'm talking AID, and sadly we don't have a Peace Corps presence there, um, to be able to get out with the people more, with the business community, with the local associations, with women's groups, with communities, with the governors and the district uh, officials, uh, the kinds of things we used to be able to do 25 years ago when I first served there, and that we've all been wanting to do. And that's why we'll be basically tripling over time, over the next two fiscal years, funds, assuming funds are available, our American officer presence, but we're also going to be uh, more than doubling our Foreign Service National Pakistani staff to also serve in Lahore and in Karachi and be able to help us get out more as well. With, with regard to the AID assistance delivery and the transference to local NGOs, what lessons have we learned in terms of accountability and sustainability um, in terms of Pakistani NGOs and, and how they're able to uh, engage in, in development, and uh, do we have outcomes measurements that we're using uh, to hold them accountable, similar to what we would be doing uh, with international NGOs and American NGOs operating with USAID contracts? A, a number of questions in, in your uh, larger question there. It's uh, a clever tactic Mr. Dreyhaus uses to <laughs> eat up his 30, 30 seconds that were remaining, but please go ahead and respond. Um, uh, uh, first and foremost, we do have to assess the capability of these groups. We have to make sure they're actually registered with their own government, um, that uh, our financial analysis and those of our uh, Pakistani firms that we use assure that, in fact, they're following their own law first to make sure they're accountable. Uh, we, we also have learned some lessons about how we do our grants, because you're talking NGOs, they're usually grants. So we don't necessarily always give it all in one big amount of money up front. We tend to give an initial amount, see how they do, give an incremental amount, see how they do, and then give a final amount. Those kinds of things to meter the flow of money to make sure we get the performance that they told us they want to do, and we are assisting them in what they claim they are good at. 
That's why we provide grants or cooperative agreements. In the case of cooperative agreements, we have a clause that's called substantial involvement. It means U.S. government has a much deeper relationship with the grantee than under a normal grant arrangement. And we exercise that through our assistance officers that are, have federal warrants. Uh, so those are just some examples. In terms of measurement, every one of our program activities has to have uh, a, 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 a measurement and monitoring plan. And then we make that available to the inspector general to hold us accountable in the way we do our business as well. Those are some of the lessons we've learned over time, Congressman. May, may I just add w one thing to it? I mean, one thing which I think you're very right to focus on is the impact on the ground. But uh, in an example like, like SWAT, just in, since September, um, the, the combination of the work of the Pakistani government in helping to uh, return uh, IDPs, but also the U.S. aid work um, uh, has really contributed to a resumption of normalcy there, which I think would have been unimaginable uh, six months ago. So helping um, to, to uh, rebuild uh, government Pakistan offices, um, helping to rebuild schools, helping to do and, and thereby enabling people to return and, and resume that degree of stability, I think has been uh, very significant from both a, a national security strategic uh, sense as well as what our overall development goals are. If, if I could just add, we also vet our partners. Uh, we are required to check to make sure that the partners that we provide assistance to are not on a certain terrorist lists. We make sure that our partner organizations are in good stead with their own government from a financial perspective and their own, whether they pay taxes or whether whatever their particular rules are. And we're particularly mindful of what was called the Negra Ponte uh, uh, guidance from the last administration, which basically asked us to assess the risk in each of our partners and to adjust our controls depending upon the risk we assess with that particular partner in that particular geographic area from the point of view of the money going to hands that it, to whom it should not go. Thank you very much. Ms. Chu, you recognize for five minutes. Uh, well, last week, a uh, militant stormed the uh, northern uh, Pakistani offices of the World Vision and uh, killed six workers, uh, injuring five. Uh, it is the world's largest uh, Christian charity and works in, in some of the poorest and most politically unstable places on earth and also educates and employs local women. Uh, all these factors make it a target uh, for uh, extremists. So there, um, what my question is, uh, concerning this situation, what implications does this have for um, Pakistani NGOs that, that receive aid, and, and what about their safety and security? Uh. Certainly, we, we condemn the actions on uh, World Vision, and we're very, very uh, sorry and troubled to have seen that incident. But it's uh, unfortunately um, not uncommon for NGOs and, and others doing this type of work to be to be targeted. Um, we have uh, we are continuing to work as as you know we discussed here today uh, within the constraints that we have to walk that fine line between. Um, continuing uh, the the very important assistance work, the work focused on uh, on women's issues and some of the other things that that World Vision was doing um, in uh, the neediest areas with the security concerns. And so, uh, I know Jim can talk a little bit more about um, the kind of security mechanisms that we uh, try to put in place or try to work through uh, in the most conflict-ridden areas. Um, but it's it's a um, as I've, as I've said, it's a constant calibration that POST uh, tries to work through in terms of uh, where we will continue to, to uh, target our work, to target our resources, to try to continue the assistance work with, while also being as, as cognizant uh, about the real risks uh, that people are facing and trying not to put them directly into harm's way. I, I would just add uh, uh, that wherever in this case, World Vision, they were not a direct uh, recipient of, of, of USAID. But where they are, we have urged our partners to come to us and say, if you perceive security risks, please describe them to us. Tell us what you feel you need for your people while they're traveling, if it's the, the kind of vehicles they travel in, if it's the protection around where their offices are. 
Those are things we can help with financially as part of a grant or cooperative agreement or contract. And we've had a lot of experience in this, but they do have to take some initiative to come to us if they perceive problems. But we're not being just passive that way. We've also reached out to them. I met with every chief of party uh, that, that of every contractor, grantee, and implementing partner in Pakistan when I was there uh, in uh, the fall. Uh, and I will be going out again soon. I will meet with them again. And one of the things we did talk about was security. Again, these were ones we support. because uh, So the, they, however, are in close touch with others who we don't support. And they share information. And we've told them anyone who particularly is U.S. registered are welcome to come to, I think it's now a monthly briefing, uh, with the diplomatic security officers. And USAID has our own security officers at the post in Islamabad where they share information, they hear about those concerns, they get advice, uh, and, uh, and there are ways to sort of establish best practices because their own network is faster and better even than ours, frankly. And there are other techniques that could be used, but this is not the appropriate forum uh, to discuss that. But we could discuss it offline if you'd like. Thank you. Uh, just as a follow-up, um, that I know that um, Many of the attacks have targeted local Muslim women who were involved with American aid organizations. Uh, is there a way to uh, balance the safety of these women involved in these programs without uh, compromising our, our goal of advancing the rights of women and girls in Pakistan? Um, well, obviously we encourage you know, uh, women's groups or women to participate in all the programs of our assistance. Um, it's first and foremost the responsibility of Pakistani security entities to protect their citizens. That said, there are some things, for example, in schooling and education that we have learned that if schools need walls built around them to protect the children, including the girls, that that is a very legitimate thing for us to do with the American people's money since we want the education to happen and we want more girls in particular to, to participate in the education system, uh, that that's a simple thing, very simple, that in fact does make a big difference. Another, frankly, is training female teachers. The more that there are female teachers in the country, the more families are willing to allow their daughters to go to school because that they, they feel that uh, the teachers will be more responsive to them and, and less of a p possible personal security ri uh, threat to them. These are things Pakistanis have told us, lessons they've learned that we want to be able to help support. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've finished our first round of questioning. With your indulgence, I'm going to see if the members want a question or two more to, before we fold here today. But uh, I'm going to start that. Mr. Flake is deferred, and, and I appreciate that. But. Um, Mr. Beaver, you, you know we concentrate a lot in this committee on the personnel over there and, and the ramping up of U.S. personnel. Uh, it's, many of us have the impression that we were hollowed out over, over a period of time, and now we've got to get our capacity back. So if we're decentralizing, we're going to smaller, predominantly Pakistani contracts that, that need oversight from people in our, uh, in our USAID, what's the recruitment process that we have to get people in? And how's that going? What are what our numbers look like? What's the training process so we get them up to the capacity that they can actually supervise and manage other people as opposed to just do certain functions? And I think, lastly, that leads to a question um, that was discussed a little bit beforehand. What, if any, legal authorities does USAID need in order to do that recruitment training and the retention of sufficient numbers of personnel for service in Pakistan? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, if, if one looked at, say, contracts officers or procurement professionals, for example, uh, we now have about a half a dozen in Islamabad. Um, these are U.S. Uh, contracts and agreements officers, not to mention uh, Pakistani. Uh, uh, we expect to expand those procurement officials in country over the coming year, probably doubling them. Uh, we expect to move them out into the local area, into Lahore and Karachi as well, to help to help uh, oversee our projects as we get. So you'll have deeper. a total of 12 in the entire country. Uh, uh, it'll be uh, 
uh, at, uh, approximately 12, as I understand it. So, so and, those 12 people will essentially do all of the procurement or, or overseeing all of the procurement? They, they also have Pakistani uh, negotiating Compass. assistants and others that have experience doing this with World Bank or ADB or others from whom we've hired some of these staff to be able to help us. And we bring in But they want to be able to, you want those people, the procurement office, to be able to know whether or not the Pakistani staff is uh, performing up to uh, yes. sufficient status or like yes. that so they're yes. fairly knowledgeable. So it's still... You've got to we're get still so building. We are still building. building if that's How many eventually getting. would you like to have? Uh, I would think we'd want to move up to 16 or 24, something like that, between the American and the Pakistani staff over time. So it basically, by the time we're in our last year of, uh, of this Kerry Luga Berman money, you'll be getting up to what point where you want to be. I think we can move much faster. We're trying to do this this year and next fiscal year. All right, so you're going to do a half a dozen more this year, but then maybe double it up in the next year. That's that's what we're tr that's what we ought to be doing. I mean, that's let's just in that it's just in that case. But in terms of project office and others, I think we have to face the reality, and you are aware of this, Mr. Chairman, that yeah. after seven or eight years of working in these highly risky conflict zones, where usually they are officers unaccompanied by their families or spouses. Um, it's taken its toll on the agency, and that's why we appreciate the support for the DLI part of the Development Leadership Program. Um, those people do have to be brought in, trained up, and, and, then, be, and then assigned to some of these more uh, challenging posts. That will take time. And that's why we're moving to expand the number of mid-career development professionals we're bringing into the Development Leadership Initiative. And we're also now recruiting outside to bring people in under what we call Foreign Service Limited um, Hire, which are Foreign Service officers, but they're limited to five-year appointments at a time. It can be renewed once. So it's a technique we've developed in Afghanistan, and we started in Iraq. I was also the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Iraq for two years. Are they, are they, these people experienced in particular areas that you're going out for these five-year we, we, we look for people who've had conflict zone experience. We've looked for, generally our requirements are pretty stiff. We look for a master's degree, if we can, uh, plus uh, eight years experience of which four has to be in conflict zones. When we can't get that, we then ask for eight years, uh, even more years of work experience. And, uh, uh, and then we do, of course, personal references on all of them. But, but I guess the other thing uh, I would just want to say here is that in terms of training them, this also takes time, and it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to do in the conflict setting, which is why we try to find people who've already got some of this experience to bring into the... To the Do you have uh, any success in bringing back former USAID uh, personnel? We have. We've reached out to uh, former senior Foreign Service and regular Foreign Service officers, and with the help of Congress, we have special provisions to bring a limited number of officers back who can be sworn in again and retain their uh, annuity as well. So in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, certain uh, uh, authorities that would be helpful to us, Congress has been forward-leaning on that. Uh, we can bring certain personal service contractors on board as well as Foreign Service Limited officers. Uh, I think the time will come, though, when we need to find ways to retain how to retain these officers in these posts that are both dangerous and they're away from their families. What are the motivations to keep them there a second year uh, or even a third year? For example, can we relocate families closer by in that theater, uh, which is what was done in the Vietnam War, uh, so that both military and civilian officers, in fact, uh, would stay longer? Uh, are there other financial incentives that potentially could be provided um, or caps lifted on the pay that they can earn? Uh, uh, these are just a couple of uh, simple examples that we really need to be looking at uh, to retain the officers once they get there. They will be four times more effective in their second year than they are in their first year. Do you have someone in your office that you could delegate uh, to deal with Mr. Flake's staff and our staff here to uh, maybe talk through some of those issues with more detail? Would be happy to, uh, okay. absolutely. Well, and I, uh, the staff director, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Wright, will contact okay. you and, and follow up on that. I, I'll just add that we have done something uh, unique in AID's history in the last uh, six months, both for Afghanistan and Pakistan. 
recognizing the challenge to get senior officers of the current Corps to come to post, we have designated all the office director positions, of which there are approximately 10 in both posts, as what we call senior management group officers. And that means the administrator personally approves who goes there. And uh, they have to be what we call FS1, class one officers, at a minimum, or senior foreign service officers to go. So normally those designations are required only for mission directors or deputy mission directors. So we have stepped up to the plate here and stepped up uh, the uh, internal incentives for our officers to serve there. Go ahead and ask your question, Jim. Chairman. If, may I just say, in, in addition to that, that um, the number of direct hires, I believe, uh, throughout uh, Pakistan have increased 70 percent uh, from 2008. I think it's gone from 336 to 580, with plans to add another 125 uh, by, by 2011. So we also are closely monitoring the staffing situation, trying to get uh, the best people out there as quickly as possible, and uh, would be happy to, to join any sort of briefing on those issues. Thank you. I was just going to ask, how, how many, can you give us a ballpark number on how many you've been able to bring back the foreign, uh, foreign service officers through this program? Uh, I, I'm going to have to give that to you separately, but I can tell you I spend a part of every day calling colleagues who used to work for AID, seeing if we can attract them back. Um, and they are serving in Iraq, they're serving in Afghanistan, they're serving uh, in Pakistan. Uh, for example, our deputy director who's in Peshawar is a uh, rehired uh, senior foreign service officer, uh, one that we are currently attracting, trying to uh, bring to Karachi as a, will be a, re, a rehired uh, senior foreign service officer. Uh, we also have looked to other missions to loan their mission directors or their deputies to Pakistan, and we've brought three uh, other mission directors out to Pakistan to help us over the past fall and winter. So we are doing everything we can to bolster the senior level of the mission. Thank you. Does any other member wish to ask an additional question? Mr. Lynch. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just to illuminate uh, the problem we're having in attracting uh, former or, or retired uh, members, uh, federal employees, uh, up until about six months ago, uh, we could not get uh, federal uh, very highly skilled uh, federal employees to come back to work for the government because they would have to, under the law, they would have to forfeit their annuity. Uh, now, corporate, uh, the corporate world has this right where they, if they have a special problem, they just pull people back in out of retirement, they go to work for them. They, that, that person has no uh, learning curve, they, they know the business as well as anyone, but we in government prevented uh, some of our most skilled foreign service officers to come back into government because we would require them to, to forfeit their, their retirement. Uh, about eight months ago, uh, Senator Cocker and I got together. Uh, we, we changed that in the defense authorization bill, but only for the last uh, six months have we started uh, to, to reach out to, to uh, former federal uh, employees who, you know, these are highly skilled folks that have 20, 30 years experience but it's only been the last six months that we've been able to bring folks back. One, one of the things I wanted to raise with you, sir, is, is that I think we only allow them to come back for two to three years, and then, and then that expires. And, and I'm just asking, you're talking about a five-year, uh, these special contracts. Uh, we might have to amend that to five years in order to get them to come back under, under your program. So maybe that's something that we could, we could work together. I happen to chair the subcommittee on federal employees, so maybe that's something we could work on. Uh, we would welcome working with the committee, uh, yourself, sir, and others on this. Uh, I'm not aware of that particular limitation, but I if it is there, I'd have to check the legislation again. Uh, and we could extend it. That would be helpful. I will just toss one suggestion out. Uh, you know, uh, under our, this is not Pakistan, but it's really Afghanistan related and uh, Iraq related up to a certain point. Um, our, our brave soldiers. Uh, that serve in wartime, in war theater, uh, are exempt from federal tax during the time that they're there, as I understand it. Also, our grantees and our contracts, uh, our grantees and our, our contractors who are there under our pay are exempt from the first certain amount of their uh, income on, on federal income tax, though they have to pay some on certain benefit kinds of packages. I think it's $75,000 or 90000 
the only, the only Americans in harm's way who do not receive that financial incentive to serve and continue to serve are U.S. government civil servants and foreign service officers right. who are in harm's way in these war theaters. Uh, so uh, I will just toss that out as something to think about whether there is a way for those officers who are in harm's way and the same places where every, all other Americans who are there receive some uh, benefit to, in, in, to, as a representation of the risks they're taking might be able to benefit from this in the future is the kind of thing that I think will help both attract and retain officers in the field. I, I totally agree with you. Uh, you know, we have, especially in Afghanistan uh, and in Iraq, where we have agricultural department employees in there, we got, you know, a lot of civilian employees in there, and uh, they're not being treated nearly the same way uh, in, in benefits or even uh, when, when they get injured uh, in, in the war zone. There's a whole different way of, of treating them. Uh, I, I don't know if I, it looks like I might have another minute left. Minute uh, what's that? Minute and eight seconds. Can you just give me a, a real thumbnail on Swat Valley? Uh, because I know that we're putting a lot of money in there. I had a chance to chat with uh, Ambassador uh, Patterson uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, that's sort of a microcosm of our, of our effort there in Pakistan in terms of pushing the capacity of the government out into some of these tribal areas. Could you just give me a, a thumbnail on that? Uh, well, uh, I, I can give you my own historic perspective. When I lived there, I used to go fishing for trout in Swat Valley. It was that safe, and it was a beautiful tourist area. Um, now, of course, it's a different situation, and I, too, was alarmed, as Dan said earlier in our testimony, at how close uh, the extremist elements were to uh, Islamabad, and that, that resonated throughout the country. Today, we're working very closely with uh, the Pakistan government and the Northwest Frontier government, as well as with General uh, Nadim and First Corps and others, and with Pakistani institutions, Parsa among them, to assist in, in the Northwest Frontier, especially Mangora and uh, SWAT with everything from reconstruction of those facilities that were damaged, but more importantly, building back, actually increasing the presence of the Pakistan civilian government, where they used to have one administrative center that may have been blown up by the Taliban when they left, there will be two or three administrative centers. Where there was one police building, there'll be two or three. Where there was one clinic, there'll be two or three. And those are ways to deepen the uh, the, the governance service delivery and the Pakistan civil service are returning to the area uh, and working. So uh, we've spent uh, quite a few hundred million dollars there, 350 to 400 million dollars in relief efforts and reconstruction. There'll be more to come. Thank you, Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very Mr. much. Chairman. Any other member wishing to ask additional questions? Uh, there being none, let me leave this last question with you, gentlemen. Is, can you tell us how much of uh, President Bush's $750 million program for Fatah has actually been obligated or spent in that region? I don't have that information off right. the top of it, but we'd be happy to. Could you give us a status report on that, on, on how course. much it's been yeah, spent, how much it's been obligated, and how much remains out there, and why it still remains sure, we'll unspent, and, and what its plans may yeah, be? We'll get, we'll get back to you on that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Flake. Thank uh, witnesses very much for your testimony, both written and oral, and your time and your staffs as well. Uh, we appreciate it. We look forward to dealing with you in the future, and we'll definitely ask uh, Mr. Alexander, Mr. Wright from the committee staff here to talk with Mr. Beaver about some of those incentives uh, as well as the tax situation that he brought up. Great. Thank you both. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned.